All right. Good morning again. So like Steve, I uh, wear many hats and I just want to make it clear that I'm going to give this presentation wearing my uh, an eye hat, not my uh, or my shirt rather in this case. So um, <clears throat> so this is this is part of the, the you know, the NI sponsor package. So NI is a diamond sponsor for this conference. And, you know, even before I was NI, like at this research, um, like we've been a primary sponsor of the conference, like since the first conference in Philadelphia. Like, was it 11 years ago, 12? Like, I can't even remember. So yeah, we've been here. Um, there's a lot of continuity. And basically, that's exactly where I want to start. I want to sort of, um, yeah, sort of bridge the gap between the last conference and this one. <coughs> and last year, we uh, announced our, um, you know, our current flagship USAP, the X410. Um, it's, a, it's a cool device, four channels, um, up to 7.2 gigahertz. Try tuning until eight gigahertz. <laughs> um, it can also do 400 megahertz of analog bandwidth, um, which means 500 mega samples coming out of the cha out of those channels. Um, it sports an RFSOC, dual 100 gigabit Ethernet if you if you need that kind of bandwidth. Um, it still has like the embedded features of like the N300 series, for example, and you can do a lot of cool stuff with that. And as a matter of fact, you can see one at our booth over there. In fact, actually, Hayden, can you just wave your hand? So he's our sales guy, and I don't I don't know if Marcus is here. Um, Marcus Unger is our product manager. There he is. So he's someone you can also ask about, like roadmap, etc. Um, if you need, you know, quotes or just technical questions, you can obviously ask me. But you can also ask those two guys. So cool use up here, um, and it sort of extends our portfolio in a great way. So if you, you know, look on on the left, like the user P B two hundred series, you know, lowest cost, but you know, also lowest capabilities. On the right hand side, the X410 or high bandwidth and you know high channel count, etc. You know, in the middle we have sort of various other devices that sort of fill all the gaps in between, like the X410, X310, our you know solid workhorse, and the N300 series with the both the embedded features and either you have a high channel count or you have like a really good bandwidth and sort of signal fidelity with the N320 series and our embedded series E310, E320. Like you can you know various things are all possible with um, this line of products. But this is old news. This is what we were already talking about last year. So let's uh, let's take a look what's happened in the meantime. All right. So um, I'm going to start with our UHD updates. So UHD is the, the sort of the software that um, drives the USRP, like it's the USRP hardware driver. And last year, we, we had just started working on the 4.1 cycle, and we had a bunch of new features in there, especially for the X410. And that's something that I just want to want to highlight here. This is very important. So we released the X410 you know, for sale when we knew we could build it and you know, reliable quality, et cetera. And, but it didn't have all, you know, everything that we could possibly do with it. Like it was not yet sort of available. So we wanted to no longer delay the actual device. But then every subsequent UHD release added new features. And um, I mean, there's a lot that goes into that. But part of that was just like sort of a tight loop with like various users of our USRPs. And many of you are sitting in the audience. So um, I mean, you could actually like go to Marcus after his talk and say, I have like a very urgent need um, for the USRP. Like, could you like, you know, think about doing this or that? And then um, you know, of course, there'll be m many other requests like that, so we can't make any promises. But that's sort of how how we sort of operate here. So we've been like adding features, um, and then th that happened with the 4.2 cycle, sort of added full 100 gigabit Ethernet, you know, at the full rate, improved record replay um, with the built-in DRAM, um, better GPIO support. I talked about that yesterday, and then you know, we just released, started working on the 4.3 cycle, and we have a bunch of new features in there as well that I'm actually going to talk about uh, later in this presentation. But something I'd, I want to also highlight, and it doesn't get enough praise, I think, is, you know, we could do a better job, but we could also do a much worse job at just, like, just maintaining the software quality by itself. You know, just make sure that it runs on all the various operating systems. You know, a new version of Boost comes out. We, you know, we need to make sure that that works. Um, there's like a lot of like small bug fixes that go into these releases that sort of sort of keep keep it like healthy and maintainable over the years. And we've been using you know we've been improving this piece of software for for a long time now. And so you know it's because of things like this. So we don't we we don't completely try and um, you know let it go stale. And I think that's a good thing. All right. Um, now, NI is a company, it's a reasonably large company, and of course there's many things that NI does that are not SDR related, but even the SDR related teams, 
So there's like the product R&D team, for example, that's where I'm from. And we, you know, we actually build the devices and make sure the drivers work and, you know, the radio integration is, is there and stuff like that. But there are other teams at NI that also work with the SDRs and sort of provide types of products. And that's something I want to talk about in, in, in this section. So in particular, I want to highlight two what we call offerings that we have available um, for people that have specific application needs. Now, um, something that's uh, popular for many reasons is like doing a wireless uh, research, like in the 5G, and then obviously in the future in the, in the 6G, or as you know, the, as I heard yesterday, like the future G space. Um, so uh, this is a standard picture of sort of a 5G cellular setup. So on the left-hand side, you have the core network and the to so the control plane and the user plane are sort of the technical terms that we use to describe those. Um, you know, that's usually all the software um, that, that, that happens there. On the right-hand side, we have the radio access network. So these are, uh, you know, the GNOTE B and the actual device, like the UE, that could be your smartphone, but it could be some kind of, you know, dongle connected to your computer. Um, all of these things. So this is just a standard picture of like a 5G setup. Um, but what if you want to start doing research in this domain? You want to sort of like start tweaking individual components. Um, like how do you actually do that? So we already, so we actually have a bunch of, we had a presentation yesterday on, um, you know, like uh, swapping out individual components using various AI features. But you have to sort of, you know, actually, you know, practically uh, like you find the screws where you can open this and that's exactly what we provide with um, this setup so this is an oai based setup so open oai is stands for open air interface it's an open source project that provides uh, 5g it also provides lte access um, and this is all like open source software based so this is stuff that you run on various servers and it's not software that we write as an i but we are an alliance partner of the open air interface alliance and so we can provide sort of a full end-to-end -end setup using USRPs, obviously, but then also like various other, um, you know, components in there. And because this is end-to-end -end open source, that means you have all the, the hooks and, you know, uh, hatches available to open and see inside and modify. Um, and you could always do that. I mean, even, even USRP1 had like, GSM-based uh, um, things running on top of that. But what's different is that we have the sort of dedicated teams that sort of make sure that this entire stack is running. And you can sort of approach us, uh, approach us as an I, say, hey, I want to I do this. I want to do 5G research using the stack. Can you get me, you know, set up, et cetera? And that's precisely um, what we can offer now. But um, outside of the 5G research, um, we also uh, like working with folks in the in doing, for example, radar or EW, um, electronic warfare research. And the requirements there are not exactly the same. So with you know, the 5G system, you want to have, you want to be able to actually do phone calls, et cetera, and then start playing around. Um, if you're doing radar research, um, typically your requirements are a little bit more low level, but you also have higher requirements when it comes to channel count and bandwidth, et cetera. So I imagine you actually want to do radar signal research, something like that, what, what would you need? So you would probably need a lot of channels, high bandwidth. Those channels need to be um, phase aligned, so they need to be phase coherent, need to be synchronized. And then you want to stream all that data somewhere. So you need like a bunch of computers to capture all of that or maybe playback. So you want to do record and playback kind of setups. Um, there's you know, and then to get that all running, you need a whole bunch of software, you know, the correct driver versions. There's probably like an optimal operating system version or kernel version. You need a lot of documentation to get that started. Maybe, you know, the actual cable matters that you're trying to use. And all of that is sort of um, something that we sort of bundle up in, um, in this specific offering. So if you're in this domain and you care about... Um, you know, setting up uh, sort of a, you know, many channel count high bandwidth uh, research platform, then that's something we can offer. And just to give you some glimpses in what that actually entails, is there's a lot of documentation. Again, there's sort of a, a dedicated team that sort of manages that, provides reference um, software as well. So um, if you go to our booth, you can ask about that. And like some of the people maintaining that are actually sitting at our booth and, and they can ans answer all the questions that you have. Um, you know, down to like which rack you should be using, um, just like details on the setup, like that's all provided in this sort of 
inside this package, nominal specs. And this means that you can um, you don't have to sort of worry about like the boring stuff, like, oh, like I have to do with the syscuttle blah blah command, yada yada. So like that's all taken care of by this documentation, etc. And you can just start streaming and start researching, etc. <coughs> okay. Um now I mentioned earlier we have a bunch of new features in UHD that we've been working on over the last year. And I want to highlight two of these because I think they're really interesting. The first one is the UHD extension API. And I need to rewind a little bit. I need to sort of provide some background here. So we often get requests for specific RF specs, right? So for example, someone might say, oh, I want to do 5G, but like I can't just use like a general purpose SDR because it doesn't neatly fulfill our, I don't know, ma spectral mask requirements, for example. And you know, we can we can handle that. We know how to handle spectral mask requirements, but we can only handle one type of specs at a time. But we don't, on the other hand, we don't want to sort of break the general purpose nature of our SDRs. And how do we resolve that conundrum? Well, sort of the, uh, um, the idea that we have here is that extensions are um, a good way to, uh, you know, make that uh, available in a, in a modular fashion. So we could say, well, the use IP stays general purpose, but then if you need specific spectral mask requirements or power requirements or anything like that, then you add uh, an RF extension is what we call it on top of the device. You can see just a rendering here, um, what it could look like. So at the bottom you'd have a use IP and then you have like short analog connections into your extension and maybe some digital control signals. And um, that that way the the other box can take care of the you know the RF requirement, so that's that's what we call an RF extension, and the extension API is an easy way to enable that without breaking your software workflows. So um, what we want to avoid is that you put on this extension API and then you have to like compile against yet another library and then there's like this other manual and yada 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 and you have to like restructure and refact your applications. That would be uh, that would be annoying because the uh, um, intention is that we add these extensions so we have like the same use IP be uh, more flexible. We don't want to be the make the software more complicated at the same time. Excuse me. <coughs> All right, and that's where the extension API comes in. Now, we didn't just um, write this extension API out of thin air. Um, so there was a there was a reason, and so we uh, we teamed up with another company called Signalcraft, and I know we have at least some, someone from Signalcraft here, Bernie. I don't know if you're in the room. If you are, then you, you could raise a hand. Okay, I can't I can't see him right now, but we have we have someone available. So this is a c company that we partnered up with, and they built this device, the SC twenty four thirty RF extension. <coughs> so it's called the SC twenty four thirty New Radio Signal Conditioning Module. And um, as you can imagine from the name, this is specifically designed um, to achieve like the RF requirements um, for five G New Radio. So if you want to build UEs or G oh there we are, we have we have Bernie over there. Hey Bernie, <laughs> um, so he you can ask him ask uh, questions about this specific box. You can also see one of those at our booth. Um, some more details. So again, um, like I showed you earlier, you would sort of put it on top of an X410. You would cable it up with like short analog connectors and short digital control connections, and and then you um, get you know 5G and R, you know compatible signals at the output. And a couple of more details here. So um, as so this is sort of a high level block diagram, what's going on on the inside. Um, so you, you can see it contains a bunch of filter banks and amplifiers, et cetera, switches. And it lets you you know, tune those filter banks, et cetera, such that you can achieve the required spectral mass for, the, for these specific um, uh, bands. And going back to my own slide deck now, um, <coughs> uh, you can see like if you actually wanted to just get started with that, the only thing you would have to do is like add a um, like a string in the initialization sequence for your device, you, as you can see here, um, to sort of notify UHD that you want to use this RF extension. But you don't have to like, um, you know, load different drivers, etc. That happens all in the background, like through some transparent DLL loading, etc. Of course, you need the soft you need some software available to do that, but you don't have to change your applications. That's the key thing. So the other thing I want to talk about is um, raw UDP uh, traffic to remote destination feature that we've just released. Um, the, uh, 
the this is a this picture is sort of a standard streaming setup. So you have a USRP and it has like what we call a radio. That's the thing in the in the USRP that captures um, you know signals and then eventually it'll get pushed out over the Ethernet connection. And then on the, on the other side we have UHD captures that traffic and then makes it available to the application. For example, into GNU Radio. Now the thing that we added is that you can sort of redirect the traffic and send it somewhere else. Um, so especially when you're in a network situation, you can just go to UHD and say, okay, like I want this frequency, I want this gain, all of that stays the same. But when you're finished setting it up, I would like all this traffic to go to uh, a UDP port on that network address, for example. And um, yeah, and this is something, you know, looks pretty simple at first glance. Um, the 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 key thing that we try to make you know, get right is the sort of coherent integration into the, the rest of RF NOC, you know, make sure we don't break any paradigms, etc. And um, that's what we did with like sort of the latest, um, if you look on Massive Branch, you can, you can play around with this feature. Um, so it's not actually in the 4.3.0.0 release that just came out because we just missed sort of a merge window there. And um, the X310 support is also not yet on the public master branch. We have like a minor glitch to, to fix there, but but we've seen it work. So just to sort of give you an give you an update on that. So whatever the next UHD release will be, we'll have that feature built in. So what can you do with that? A um, couple of things. So this gives you a lot more flexibility when it comes to streaming. So before, if you were running a UHD session and connecting to multiple USRPs, all of the USRPs would send the data back to the same UHD session, which is running on a single computer. That sort of limits your available streaming bandwidth just on the software side. And that's gone now. You can just like stream data wherever. And if you're sort of in a you know, arbitrary topology, you can stream data left or right wherever it needs to go. But you don't. You never sort of leave the paradigms of RF NOC. Like you, you can always like, um, you know, reuse everything that uh, that you've been using in the past. For example, if you wrote some custom RF NOC block, if you want to send raw UDP traffic back to the USRP, that's something we have on our roadmap, but not in the near future. Um, it's this is slightly more difficult for various reasons that I don't really want to go into um, right now. But yeah, we you know, there's something we have on our on our agenda. And one thing you could do with that is you can actually take the data and modify it on the USRP before you start streaming it, blasting it out to the um, to, to 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 you know whatever the, your endpoint is. <coughs> and one thing you can do is you can say, "Oh, I'm going to take this data and turn it into VITA 49 frames and then send it out." Now we have two modes of streaming, um, or at least two modes. We have a few more. There's some sub nodes, etc. But but um, th like two two uh, things that you can do with the traffic that's going out is you can enable or disable our our um, own packet format. So our packet format is called Cheddar, and you can say I want to keep the headers of those Cheddar packets if you know how to interpret them. You know we've documented that, but that's that's extra work on your end. You might not want that. You can also say I just want to have the raw payload, but if the raw payload is a VITA 49 frame. Boom, you have a device generating by the 49. And as a matter of fact, our friends at Microsoft did exactly that. So this slide is also, again, this is not my slide. This is from Microsoft. Um, thank you very much for providing that. Um, what they would like to have is the ability to do exactly this in satellite ground stations. Um, and the specific uh, VITA 49 um, dialect that they use there is called Diffie. So they built and open sourced uh, an RF knock block that generates Diffie frames. And in com combination with this like feature of the ability of sending your frames wherever you, you like, you now have a digitizer running in your satellite ground station that can speak to other Diffie compliant devices. So that's, that's really neat. All right, um, okay, so that's what we've been doing. So we sort of caught up in time now. I've brought you to like, uh, you know, September 2022. Um, but I do want to give you a bit of a glimpse into the future now at this point. So actually, I'm a bit ahead of time here. I hope you have some questions. <laughs> oh, that's not right. T Tom can always fill the, <laughs> fill the gap. Um, where was I? So glimpse into the future, a future roadmap. And this is where I always get a bit n nervous because that means I have to, you know, once, uh, once, we, once we show this stuff, we, of course, have to deliver it. Um, yeah, but here we go. <laughs> so um, so I, I showed you a whole bunch of things that we've been working on. So as you know, the UHD side, you know, we've been adding features every release. We've been you know fixing small stuff as well, but like a lot of new features, like the extension API, raw UDP streaming, 
Um, you know, RF NOX streaming is actually pretty capable these days. You can do multi-gigahertz streaming with RF NOX. It's not something, you know, you know the, the like the the X410, for example, you, you would have half a gig sample uh, as a max rate, but RF NOX is capable of doing that. Um, and we have like 100 gigabit Ethernet to support that as well. So what if UHD is too slow? No worries. We have <laughs> we have our raw UDP streaming improvement. And then, of course, we have all those... Um, you know, system design, you know, system offerings that we have to offer the, you know, I mentioned earlier, like the 5G, 6G research setup and also the, you know, radar EW research setup. So we have all of this stuff going on at NI. So, so what do we do next? And, you know, it kind of, kind of feels like we need to build another, another device, another, another use IP. So, so that's what we did. So we, um, I'm proudly, uh, um, like for the first time, you know, in introducing our next, uh, use IP. It's not available yet, um, slated for, early next year, the X440. Um, the, it, you can see like uh, the rendering at the bottom right, this looks a bit like a, an X410. That's because we are using the same, you know, the same chassis and the same, like a similar motherboard. It's not exactly the same. But what's different is, is that we're going up to eight channels now and uh, also higher bandwidth. So channel bandwidth, at least a uh, gigahertz um, of bandwidth. Um, we can't actually fit that many SMA connectors, so we had to go down to MMPX uh, connectors, as you can see. Um, yeah, but it gives you a whole lot of bandwidth available to, for all sorts of applications here. Now, how do we do that? Um, now, this is where the extensions come in. We actually removed the whole bunch of analog circuitry, and we are now using because we can have these high, we have these high data rate, high converter rates on the RF SOC. We can actually use direct sampling here, so there's no mixers on on here. But that also makes it a little bit easier for us to achieve phase coherency. So um, you can run the um, the converters up to four gigahertz. You can use you know two Nyquist zones, which means you can go up to um, at least three point six gigahertz of you know analog frequency if you if you run at a, at a four uh, gigahertz um, sampling rate, and um, that already gives you like a lot of of capabilities. <coughs> Of course, uh, it's beca because it's X410 based, we have all the features that we had in the past, like 100 gigabit Ethernet. You're gonna, you're probably gonna need that if you want to stream out that amount of data. Um, but um, the one thing that we did change is we switched from speed grade one to speed grade two because it's gonna be really important to be able to hit those, you know, high high rates when you're building bit files. Yeah. Um, who's gonna? Oh yeah. I I just wanted to prove that we're actually building this. Here's a picture from from the lab. Um, you know, not not entirely complete, but this is what our software guys are working with right now to make it make it work. And you can see all the LEDs blinking, etc. So it's it's a real thing. It's not just not just vaporware. And um, so what can you do with it? So because it's a direct sort of sampling architecture, you know, like basic RX, like in the past, like you probably want to at least use some kind of filtering if you want to connect it to um, whatever your application is. But what's also likely is that you would use some kind of external RF extension, maybe for up and down conversion that would give you like all the frequency ranges that this can't hit otherwise. Um, and I think like a, a, a great um, use case for this is in, is in satellite ground stations because opera operators of satellite ground stations, they they know their RF, like, you know, up down conversion filtering. That's that's something that they know very well. So this this might this might fit in just, um, you know, pretty well, has high bandwidth and a lot of channels in a small form factor. Um, but you really anything that requires, you know, High channels, high bandwidth, and you can use some kind of filtering. This is this is definitely a useful application, a, a useful device. I mean, all right. Um, I'm gonna leave a little bit of time for questions, and then we're gonna go over to to Tom, who will introduce the keynote. But um, I just want to sort of you know summarize what I spoke about. So you know we we have like a long continuity here, like coming from you know our sort of lower cost the devices up to the you know X440 that I just um, talked about. Um, <coughs> Because we have this, br oh, no, I don't know. Because we have this, with this broad, um, uh, you know, spectrum of devices, we can fill a lot of gap. We, we can we can fill a lot of applications, a lot of niches here, um, and you know, provide provide the the right hardware. But we also have like sort of you know systems folks that sort of work on putting it all together. And of course, we're still you know making sure that you know our software works on all the various uh, operating systems, etc. So we want to try and keep that running as well. So yeah, I think we're well set up uh, going forward. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to take your questions for the next few minutes. Thank you. Uh, 
All right, it is great to see that UHD continues uh, evolving, even in my uh, my absence. Any questions for Martin? Yes. So you've got the Nyquist on the 440 at 1.8 gigahertz. Is that tunable? Because a lot of the L and S band for downlinks that you're talking about going after cover one to two gigs. So that's going to be right in the middle of a lot of the downlinks. So is that a tunable parameter? Are you guys going to look into yes, extending that out to a further than 1.8? Because right in the middle. So so it's not only tunable, but also that's 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 a new feature. It's separately tunable on the on the on 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 four sets of channels. So you can have two. Two different Nyquist rates, and that way you can actually cover. You know, you can even cover like the uh, like a uh, the entire range. You can just like choose a different Ny Nyquist range rate on like a different set of channels, and then you you don't have to like you know touch that annoying gap in the middle where you have to sort of switch between the Nyquist zones. Yeah, it's a great question. I should have said that. <laughs> All right, got another question from the audience. Um, so Gnu Radio is a great tool. I love using it. Um, the the Me problem too. that I run into, thank you. <laughs> the the problem that I run into is the use cases and performance uh, of new blocks, right? So you're you're rotting, you're you're adding raw UDP. You're you're doing these things. Are you going to have uh, use cases? What it extends to, how far it goes, and and what it actually does for your system. Um, and, and in a broad sense, that is, are you going to show performance capabilities and are you going to show where this wouldn't be useful, I guess? So, um, yeah, I guess, I, guess, I guess what you're hinting at is, like, we give you, like, the raw bandwidth, but, like, we leave you, like, to deal with it. Um, so, yeah, we, we're definitely going to show, like, sort of performance. Uh, you know, we're going to grab a gigahertz of spectrum and then show that that meets the requirements. Um, you know... You mentioned GNU Radio. Um, like uh, GNU Radio won't be out of the box able to handle like multiple giga samples worth of streaming, and and you know we we can solve that just by releasing the X440. Um, but I mean, one thing we have been doing is providing, for example, our FNOC integration for GNU Radio, so you can do pre-processing on the device. In this case, it's not clear how much processing power we will be able to put onto the FPGA because like it just running eight channels already takes a lot of, you know, real estate on the FPGA, but. Assuming you could leave some space, then you know that would be one way to solve that problem, where you just basically do some pre-processing on on the device, and and also, you know, if you stream out of hundred gigabit Ethernet, it doesn't have to go straight into Guna Radio or another computer. You can, for example, move it into um, you you could have an FPGA card with a hundred gigabit Ethernet and, and do an more pre-processing there. Um, you know, there's 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 ways to deal with that, and we also have like um, you know partners that have like just very capable software. Who um you know who who think they can actually work with these rates, but um I, you know GNU Radio three point ten is not one of them. I, I admit that is true, but you don't have to run it at, at you also don't have to run it at like a gigahertz. Right, you can also run it at, at low bandwidth, and you still have like the the large number of channels. And then GNU Radio comes in handy again because you can distribute your channels onto various compute nodes, and and you know do something with that. I, don't know, I think I gotta um so Marcus is raising his hand, but I think I gotta gotta. Get to your time, I know. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, just to quickly to add to that uh, question, um, this device will be used as the next as evolution for the reference architecture that, that Martin was showing earlier uh, for the radar and EW research. So that is going to be a practical example of how to use it, uh, how to uh, dimension your, your surrounding systems, what kind of IOs you need, um, that, that kind of uh, stuff. And, and we're going to benchmark it, uh, like how many channels with what kind of bandwidth can you, uh, can you do there. Um, so yeah, you're going to have practical examples of, of what you need to get it running in that capacity. I think that's all the time we have for questions. So thank you very much. And we are available for more questions offline. Bye. All right, thank you, Martin.